unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. In John 12, 24, I'd started something on the spirit of multiplication. And I told people that there are laws of multiplication. Multiplication for an individual is not a mistake. Hallelujah. It's not a what? A mistake. John 12, 24 says, verily, verily. When you read that from the Aramaic, it means this is a timeless truth. Everywhere in scripture where you read verily, verily, it means that is a timeless truth. That means for as long as the earth remains, this principle will be in work whether you want it or not, whether you believe it or not. Are you following me, children of God? This principle will remain and abide forever as long as the world remains. When he says verily, verily, he means this is a timeless truth. You cannot run away from it. You can't escape its reality. You can't ignore its fact. And then you can't uh, put away its effect on a man. For as long as the earth remaineth seed and harvest, seed and harvest, seed and harvest, seed and harvest, seed and harvest. You plant, you reap. You reap, you plant. Your harvest is your seed. What you plant is what you reap. Unfortunately, many people only look at that area in the issue of money, but seeding is deeper than money. We have learned to sow to the spirit way deeper things. You understand what I'm saying? Let me give you an example. The Bible tells you and I that we are stewards of the mysteries as a very powerful thought. What a blessing that God calls you a steward of the mysteries. He says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries. Let me explain what I mean by that. We are the keepers of sacred things. For example, I have a household. And in my household, for example, I have very... Um, priceless materials. You get it? For example, I have a land title in my house. If that land title gets out of my hands and perhaps is stolen and then goes through certain systems, I might wake up and have a 20-year or 10-year case trying to prove that that is my house. Even if I have built it with my own hands and I have the proof, I even invested the money and I have people who even bear witness that I built this house. And then somebody steals that land title forges your signature, goes through lands, does all the notices they know, and then they translate that title into their name. And then one day you get an eviction letter and they say this house does not belong to you. Yes, you built it with your money. Yes, you built it with everything of yours in your own strength. And then you start going to court. No, that's a lie. I didn't steal my land. It belonged to me. That's for my signature. And then they get signature experts and sort of a signature expert looks through and for some reason says, no, 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 actually this signature is yours. It doesn't matter how much you try to prove Certain things can turn against you, and this very house that you owned, you lose it. And then you start to realize that you spent hundreds of millions on that property, you spent time on that property, you consulted many ideas from the engineers to the construction project manager to, to the architect of that building, to all the guys who did and had all these little things, the landscape, the interior, and all the many people were involved. It was a home for you. Your children sat there, your wife was there and everything. But then a small piece of paper has changed the destiny of your property. You understand what I'm saying? Yet the things that you have used to build that same property are way more expensive than that little piece of paper. But there is value because of the words that are written on and the signatures that are appended on that piece of paper. You understand what I'm saying? In literal sense, even though you own that land and own everything there, its representation of ownership is a small thing. Even people who are transitioning from an old system of economics into modern systems of economics like blockchain technology, that one day you're going to have, for example, a land title in the air because of blockchain technology. You're going to keep intellectual property there. 
You're going to keep contracts there. You're going to tell somebody, I love your land, and then you go on the internet, and then you're going to give them the details, and they'll know whether there's an encumbrance, what's the size, and that's the same thing on the ground because everything is carried up there. And then they'll sign a contract on air, and then they'll have treated that contract, and then they'll transact money, and then before you know that, you've had ownership without even money changing hands. Even to that extent, it is still saying that the contract system stays, the concept stays, the idea stays. It's just becoming smaller as men invent newer ideas of this implicity. But the, still the concept stays that what you possess sometimes is represented by some minute thing of whose value sometimes might not be equal to the very value of what you possess, but the words on it and the implication of that contract are bigger than the amount of money that you've spent for that thing. And that thing represents your ownership of that thing. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if I get my land title and then I come to you and I say, you are the person who can keep my land title for me. I've made you a steward of that mystery. Because that land title being represented by a piece of paper already in its own has its mystery. You understand what I'm saying? So when the Bible says that we are stewards of mysteries, we are stewards of mysteries, it means God has entrusted, not as though that what he's entrusting us with can be stolen, huh? but it means he has entrusted us with priceless things. He has trusted us with, with expensive things of the kingdom. You, you understand what I'm saying? You're seated there, you look like a normal person, but if we could do the math of what you are entrusted with, it's amazing to even imagine what the Lord has entrusted you with. The Lord has entrusted us with much. Hallelujah. You've heard of the scripture that says, and this was the wisdom that was hid uh, from the ages past and now revealed, now revealed. That means even when he was talking to Isaiah, there are things he hid from him. When he was talking to Ezekiel, there are things he hid from him. When he was talking to Jeremiah, there are things he hid from him. And when you appear in 2018, he says, Apostle Grace. Hallelujah. Now, how you deal with these things in the principle of seed and harvest matters. How faithful are you to the oracles? You're faithful to your wife? Praise God. You're faithful to your husband? Praise God. You're faithful to your children? Praise God. You're faithful to everything around you. Some of you, you're very faithful at your workplaces. When they say, we want you to report at 8 a.m., you are at your workplace at 8 a.m. It's only the house of God that you come at your time. You understand? How you handle the oracles of God defines the seed. It defines sowing to the spirit. He says, if you sow of the flesh, you'll surely what? Die. Sometimes it's not a physical death. Stuff and around you starts to die when you don't have priorities in the spirit. How many of you have understood what I mean? Stuff around you will start to die when you don't understand your priorities in the spirit. And he says, and if you sow to the spirit, you shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Of course, there has to be a sort of perfect balance. You understand what I'm saying? There has to be a sort of perfect balance. Perfect balance is a principle in the spirit. It is a principle in the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? When you say balance, what do they mean by balance? Balance does not mean that you forget your priorities. No. Balance means that you put your priorities in the right perspective of revelation. But that does not mean that God doesn't require a sort of reconciliation in this balance. That's a huge wisdom there. Huge, huge. Let me give you an example. Can I give you an example? Spirit, circle. Soul, circle. Body, circle. Huh? So you have this circle of the spirit. You have this circle of the body. You have this circle of the soul. There is that middle intersection. You remember when we were doing sets, mathematics sets? Eh? Uh -huh. There was a time where they used to draw the three. Huh? One, two, three. Then they shed the particular area. 
You understand? As of either between one set to another or another set to another or the intersection of all the three sets. The intersection of the three sets is what they call the perfect balance. It's a very spiritual thing. For example, look at how the world communicates. Let's look at how the world, the world communicates. There are three principles in the spirit of communication in the world, but also have a literal interpretation, even spiritually, right? Some of you have heard of the concept idea called ethos. Some of you have heard of a concept idea called pathos. And then you've heard of a concept idea called logos. So, ethos, pathos, logos. The middle there, that intersection, is a perfect balance. You must know how to communicate by ethos, by pathos, and by logos. So, there are many areas in life that always seek a perfect balance. Let me give you an interesting one. God. Family. Ministry. You understand what I'm saying? Of course, the Bible tells you and I to put God first, isn't it? You put God first. Okay? You put God first. Your family should know that God is above them. You understand what I'm saying? Your family should know that if God tells you to sacrifice Isaac, you'll kill him. That's how much you love God. <laughs> Look, some mothers are like, that's why Abraham didn't tell Sarah on the mission. Sarah was going to be like, Sevo, Sevo, Sevo. This is not God. This is not, this is, this is not God. You separated us from your dear family. You took me from our family. Remember when the Lord told you, leave your kinfolk, your family, and go to a place I'll show you? Oh, and then we went hoping the place was going to flow with milk and honey. We reached Canaan, and it was a lowly land. It was a dry place. And I stuck with you, Abraham, because I loved you. And we have believed God now. I'm 80-something, 90. The Lord has promised that out of my womb shall come a child. I'm 80-something, 90-something. And then I'm having a baby when you are 100. And then you come and tell me God has told me to kill the boy, Abraham. Then there is your family. That's number two. Right? Your family is number two. Then your ministry and your job are like there. But also, for example, let me show you a very interesting contradiction here. Not really contradiction, but the place of wisdom. Between the family and God, there are compromises. Between God and ministry, there are compromises. Between family and God, there are compromises. Between ministry and family, there are compromises. You understand what I'm saying? Not all ministry is God. Huh? Not all ministry is God. You don't mean that because you're a minister, God is in it. You can actually minister when God is not in it. And not all God is ministry. Hmm? And not all God is ministry. Not all ministry is God. And not all God is ministry. That means a man can be with God without ministry. You understand what I'm saying? Let me give you an example of this balance. God comes first. Family second. Ministry is there, like a third set. But also, there are parts in ministry that are God, and there are parts in ministry that even if they might be God, but they compromise with family, and sort of God will prefer family above ministry, in certain, in certain. For example, if a man requires to be a bishop, huh? the minister, he's a minister. Says so if a man requires a bishop, or an overseer of a Presbyterian, the Bible says that man requires a good thing. Okay, and the next verse says, hey, a bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, husband of one wife. Now, if he has two husbands, even if he desires to be a bishop, there's a contradiction there spiritually. Yes, he's a man of God. He's anointed by God. Okay, and then he says, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to charity, up to teach, uh -huh, uh -huh. not given to wine, not striker, not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Continue on that one. Listen, one that rules well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now listen to that balance. For if a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? 
Now God is saying, yes, I know you love me. I know you are anointed. I know you want to serve me, yes. But if you don't fix your wife and children, boss, don't stand on my altar. Hey, hey, but I love you, God. You called me, anointed me, yes. Fix your marriage before you stand on my altar. In that instance, brother, at that particular point, the family became more important than these my thousands. You understand what I'm saying? Your children should know that you love God much. You can do anything for God much. And your children should know that they are parts of God that are ministry. But they should also know that you prefer them above anybody you minister to. You understand? Because your girl is not going to die of weed while you're dying to rescue another man's daughter. That's foolish. Your household must be in order before you minister to the church of Christ. But that doesn't mean that you avoid the basic responsibility in the name of as attending to my family because there's a wisdom that requires you to do the right thing at the right time. Some of you, you give excuses for not serving God because of children. Oh, so, so if you didn't have them, you'd serve? Is that what you're telling God? Is that what you're telling God that that, that command made you busier? You understand? Is that what you're telling God? That he blessed you with a man so you're busier because you have a man? Is that what you're telling God? That you have children, therefore you're not going to serve God? Also, the children that came your way were a hindrance to the call of God upon your life? Huh? You understand what I'm saying? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's the part where also God is in the ministry. But then there are also parts where God will side with your family above your ministry. You understand what I'm saying? And the man of God to know the perfect balance. You cannot understand the principle of seed and harvest when you've not understood the perfect balance of the spirit. Otherwise, some of you sow to the flesh and you think you're sowing to the spirit. Some of you sow to the flesh and you reap corruption and corruption starts to surround you but your sort of seed looked like it was spiritual you know we're living in a generation where people don't know the difference between what is spiritual and what is carnal and there are many things done in the name of carnality and they appear to be spiritual or natural but they are very carnal hallelujah that is why it's important for you always to examine yourself if you're in the perfect balance because if you're not things around you will crumble they'll start to fall apart like you know what Achebe said things will start falling apart in your lives. Some of you, by the way, if you examine yourselves, your finances, your health, your marriage, your relationships, if you took time to really examine yourself, you realize that you failed to find perfect balance. That's why they say their marriage is unstable. If I have a four-legged chair and then I cut off one leg, what will it be? It will be an unstable chair. It does not carry the perfect balance because the perfect balance has usually sometimes in many times perfect balances follow certain dimensions for example the chair you're seated on is four-legged your, your the bed you sleep on is four-legged the car you're driving is four-wheeled you understand what i'm saying the perfect balance oh let me go deeper you remember when he says that a cone of wheat does not uh a cone of wheat except it fall to the ground and die it does not it abides alone but when it goes and dies it bringeth forth much fruit let me give you a mystery. Remember, when this seed goes, the body of that seed dies and the germ comes out and that life spreads out and out of the ground comes the blood, the stalk and the ear. If you're a reader of agriculture or has have understood how corn and wheat work, some of you will know that every seed of corn, if it is planted in the right ground, given the right nourishment, given the right seeding and everything necessary, every corn of wheat by the principle, the law of harvest, every corn of wheat. And I thank God that he used the word corn of wheat. He didn't say seed of mango. He didn't say seed of pineapple or seed of orange. God had a deeper mystery to explain. Every, listen, every corn, every corn of wheat produces four ears. You understand what I'm saying? Produces four ears. And every corn Every ear, every one ear of a corn, at least, minimally, produces about 700 grains. Now, remember again the four? The balance. Huh? 
700, it is 7 by 100. 7 meaning the perfection. 100, we're talking of the fold. Remember when he's talking about how you reap 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold? What is 4 times 700? 2,800. 4, 700. How that concept works? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting how it works. But you see, that's how you separate 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, he says, it abideth alone. And when it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. Hallelujah. One, you always have to keep in your mind that this will never and has not and should not be about you. It's not about you. Serve for a bigger picture. Serve for your children. Serve for your children's children. Don't just get a deal for you so everybody knows you, that you have you. No. Do things to the glory of God. Do things that people should see and say that this woman or man did not live for themselves. Praise God. We don't live for ourselves. We don't live for ourselves. I could lose anything in this world, but not you. Because we live for you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. A man cannot have perfect ministry, perfect multiplication, when you have not understood perfect balances. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs, the Lord hates unjust weights and unperfect balances. He hates imperfect balances. He hates it. He hates it when you're, you're not balanced in the spirit. He hates. He doesn't like it. But again, remember the principle is around the three. And the four that I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Another important thing on the principle of multiplication. Uh, I, I mentioned Meraki. Praise the Lord. Now, let me probably give you one more. When I was in university, and I had encountered God, there are realities that were revealed to me. One, I didn't have the language and the qualification, the power that comes in the qualification. Overseeing, eh? You remember when Jesus is speaking in scripture and he says, those of you who are able to bear it, receive it. Huh? For example, when he's talking about eunuchs, he says, he that is able to take it, to receive it, let him receive it. Huh? Receiving has an ability. Are you following me? Receiving certain things has a certain ability. When he says receive, it means it's given. He's not talking about getting what is not available. He's talking about what is available. You understand? Let me give you a simple example to understand this. If you had a problem, a, a challenge with your spouse, you're married and then your spouse messes you up, okay? Some people use the word, it's normal. I don't find that normal. Praise God. It's not normal. That's even when you read scripture, there's nothing called normal like that. It's, it's how the world is going to accept that you have to, to have a certain kind of marriage uh, to, to explain the excuses of being inefficient. But that nonsense we hate, we, we refuse in the mighty name of Jesus. You, you can disagree and not quarrel. It's possible for her to love red and you blue. What the heck? You're still lovers and God has ordained you. Separate what you disagree of and who the two of you are. It doesn't mean that because she doesn't see the blue there for you. Some people are funny. Praise God. But you have a huge challenge and you're fighting, right? And then your little five-year-old girl comes and says, Daddy, mommy, why are you fighting? Sit down. You understand? And then your five-year-old tells daddy, So, daddy, mm-hmm. are you quarreling with mommy? Speak louder, you know. <laughs> is that child able? Is that child able to reconcile the two of you? Why? Because their brain 
cannot get to the level of understanding the complexities and dichotomy of the simplified revelation of marriage. You get my point? Be wamvu. That's why some of you, when they ask you, so tell me what happened. You say, ah, 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 long story. Either you're not in the mood of explaining or they're not able. You understand what I'm saying? They're not able. If it was an age issue, I would not qualify to preach to some of you. You understand what I'm saying? If it was simply an age issue, I would not qualify to talk to some of you. You understand? If it was simply a money on account, I would not qualify to talk to some of you. If it was simply my years of experience, I would not qualify to talk to some of you because even if I calculate my years of experience, they still do not match some of your experiences. If I'm counseling couples, it doesn't mean I've been married. You understand what I'm saying? If I'm pastoring these people in these few years, two, three years you've known for Nero, what about 10 years? What about 20 years? Where are we going? How about that man who has been pastoring people for 40 years and they're still having 20 members or 30 or 40? And they're way older than me. They're 40 or 60 years older. What principle is working in their lives that is not working in mine? This God even gets to babes, the Bible says, and ordains praise that he might silence the enemies of the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? I could have a 30 something body, but when my brain is ancient, <laughs> my spirit is ancient. You need to first know where I got it from. Oh, how I pick this thing up to understand what I mean. That is the ability that I have by God to multiply in the ministry. You understand what I'm saying? You can come before a man who has the ability to give you a deal of $100 million and you have the expertise to execute the deal of $100 million. And then they bring another guy competing with you on the same deal and he does not even carry a fraction or even 10% of your ability to execute the same contract. And then they undergo, you know, the basic meritocracy. How does this person, how are they able? They start interviewing. Eh? For example, when you're going for a job, they do what? They interview, right? If you look at that literal word interview, it's to view inside you, to dissect and see what they don't see physically. Because you can appear in that office and look like the best accountant in the world. You, you, some of you, by the way, you kill with appearances. You understand? That's why some people are surprised sometimes. If I, Apostle Grace! But I thought you were your apostle. But you are young. Some lady came to me years ago and said, I wanted to submit to you, but I saw you were young. So I went to a man who looked like a father. But what did they mean by father? <laughs> so a couple of months they came back and said, Sorry, I made a mistake. Now I want to submit to you. So I said, So what have you seen this time? Have I gained weight? Oh, am I a bit older? With a dirty figure. With a deep voice. Responsible, have 20 children. Many people walk by sight. That is why some of you, you're making mistakes in relationships. Are you moving by sight? Or do you interview? Do you enter this person and understand why he is what he is or who she is? Some of you say they love you, you're beautiful. Whoop! Then you faint a bit. Then they get you up. Whoop! You understand what I'm saying? Why are you in that relationship? When you see through that man, what do you see? I see love. <laughs> Some of you, I wish you meet people who have dated, had marriage, what, and they got tired. Some of you need counseling from women who have experienced certain things. And they tell you, 
Because when you're older, you're wiser. Praise God. Is that woman a builder or a breaker? Has she added on you or subtracted? Since you met him or her. You get my point? Do they look like they're going to add on you? No, they can appear. But now, and you know people in dating, eh? <laughs> people can appear. Yes, man of God. Right away, man of God. How high, man of God? <laughs> the day you get married, gwe. <laughs> Praise God. But I'm talking about Abel. Some of you, you have the skill to do the multi-million dollar business, but you're not able. You don't carry the unseen character of the spirit to sustain $100 million. But you have the physical merit. Oh, but the rest is not the swift, but the strong, brethren men of skill. There's time and chance. Time and chance. Time the experiences of the spirit. And chance they are the opportunities of the spirit. In 2004, you go read about this. I was reading about, you know, the universe. Very interesting things about planets, how they work, how they evolve, how they... It was an interesting study. And then I realized that in 2004, Americans sent the first two rovers on Mars to explore the land. Remember, like, uh, they tell Joshua, the spies, Moses tells the, the guys to, 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 to go and spy the land. They sent two rovers on Mars. Of course, they couldn't send human beings. Mars is very cold, very, very cold. And, of course, there were traces that there was water, but probably it was dried up. There's actually no atmosphere in Mars. And interestingly, in 2004, the two rovers they sent, one was called Spirit, and the other one was called Opportunity. Time and chance. Ecclesiastes. You don't get it. Have you gotten it? These things are more spiritual than many of you assume. They are more spiritual than many of you assume. They are not on Mars because they are the swiftest, or the strongest, or the wisest, or men with understanding. But they're exploring Mars because of the spirit, time, and the opportunity of God. Uganda just discovered oil. Right? Or so to speak. But this may, white people knew long ago. There's a f- pastor friend of mine who a man showed him the whole map of where all the oil is in Uganda. Before even they announced. Some of our people knew the oil where it was. There's a man right now going to sleep hungry, yet under him there's diamond. And he doesn't even know. And he's going to die. The first time the British went into Botswana, we went to South Africa, the first thing they looked for was diamond and gold and all these kinds of things. When these black people dying down there, they were. You mean all South Africans are rich? No. But nations have built economies on the very wealth of these black people. Almost 70% of what leaves Africa into the countries abroad the conglomerates, the large things. For example, you have the, the big, the standard charters, and all those big, big companies that make money from Africa, but somehow that money again goes back to where these companies come from. You're going to realize that Africa receives aid 30% of the 70 that comes out of her. Scientists have proved, geologists have proved that the mineral wealth in the DRC is equal to the total wealth in the United States of America. One nation carries all the wealth of one continent. But everything is in DRC. Death is there. Funny politics is there. Uh, Insecurities are there. Bondage is there. Sicknesses are there. What is in there? Frauds are there. Uh, what, what is in there? Corruption is there. What is in there? Three quarters of the world's cobalt is in DRC. Yet that very cobalt is the major mineral that Elon Musk uses 
to make electric cars and he has billions and billions and without cobalt he can't make an electric car and the kids who are doing that in the drc don't even have enough money to eat food they're not even in school and they're handling it even without safety gear and inhaling it and poisoning their lungs and they're gonna fall sick and they'll not have even enough money to feed them they have the opportunity but they're not able elon musk has the ability and he makes billions of dollars every year you know why i preach these things because i believe in here there's a light there's a light that is falling on somebody to see what i'm seeing and if it falls men will look at this ministry and believe that we knew god a certain way praise the lord jesus christ men will look at this ministry and believe that we knew god a certain way the richest people will come from here the greatest ministers will come from here the best career people will come from here not by might not by power but by his spirit said the lord the most successful business in the world will come from here the best families will come from here i don't know whether you're receiving it or you're just observing me to the glory of god to the glory of god the question is are you able to handle this ministry are you able or you're deceived by the shadows that cover you if a man was a minister and he has a wonderful ministry of 20,000 people and then he grows old and then passes over that ministry to his son huh? that boy is different from a boy who began that same his ministry from scratch and if this principle of multiplication works on that boy he cannot maintain 20,000 members or grow to 30. He must prove a hundredfold. I know a man, uh, he was a millionaire uh, in the dollars. He came to Uganda in a secret mission, went up country, started living in little, little shacks, small little poor houses. He was just exploring what it is like to live a poor life, but he was a multi-million dollar person. This guy, he says his grandfather, began their family company at hundred thousand dollars the father grew it to a million is it a million dollars yes when he left it with the son the son built it to a billion dollars that's what they call a hundredfold you see the company began with a hundred thousand dollars passed it on to the father the father in his generation drew it to a million the boy has drawn it to what a billion yes so from hundreds to million to billion and that man if the same principles are passed on his grandchild will take it to a trillion that's the spirit but if you talk to the man if you interact him you realize he didn't just take over a million dollars he had the ability to take it to a billion there's something they put in him Read flashes of thoughts. Sultan Al Maktoum, the leader of uh, the UAE. Go read the principles he writes. You realize that they were passed on from generations. If you go to Saudi Arabia 50 years ago, you cannot believe how it looked like. I wish some of you look for pictures of the United Arab Emirates 50 years ago. And then see what these boys have done in the past 50 years. And he tells you these things were first in my grandfather, went into my father, and now work in me. What are you teaching your children? What principles are you putting into your children? Oh, you just buy them ice cream. What are these things in you? When I was in primary seven and I finished primary seven, my father went and spoke to a woman and said, I want my boys working. I started working when I was 13. You understand? I started working when I was 13. I remember that whole P7 VAC. I was among the first employees 
of what they call Delight Uganda. These cheer drinks you drink. We used to open cups. I seal with my own hands. I know the smell of bond glue. I know how to pack stacks. Whether you're talking of box or what, get me boxes. I'll show you how 10 boxes can fit in a small space. I know every lit. I know how to smell it. I know how, I know every chemical put there. I know how it works. I know what you drink. I know, I know everything. Because we were in a little room and she built it into a multi-billion dollar company when we were watching that little room like this. Give me a mid-business deal, I'll show you. You bring me any deal of business, I'll show you that I'm deep. For me, business is natural in my head. I know how to do, I know how. I don't do deals and they fail. Praise the Lord Jesus. But my father pushed that in us when we were little. Senior four, come to the shop. You have to work with me. You sit there, you cut a wire. You get bored, you're counting money, it doesn't make sense, but it's trying to put a principle in you. So, as a family, we are street smart. Praise God. We know our way around. Even if you woke me tomorrow and you gave me nothing and I began from scratch, I know my way around Kampala enough. Take me anywhere around Kampala. I know everywhere. I know everywhere. I know everywhere. I know everywhere. Take me through, you just take me to town and tell me move the whole of Kampala. I know that town business central. Because somewhere something took me there for something. But some of you, your children are 15. They don't even know where the old park is. <laughs> I rebuke in the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Are you able... Are you able? That's why later in that Christian scripture, he says, who of you starting to build this, not count the cost of it, whether he has enough to finish it? What's this cost? What's this ability? Some of you, you're believing God for ministries. You don't have the ability to sustain. I speak upon your life by God that as you hear this series, he'll cause you to multiply in many ways. In your marriage, in your relationships, in your business, in your ministry, in your career, in every aspect of your life. Perfect balance and distinct multiplication will be shown in Jesus' mighty name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowships at uma multipurpose hall from 5 p.m to 8 p.m you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash fenero fenero make manifest